everyone. Welcome to church. If this is your first time with us, my name is David. I serve as the lead pastor here, and we're so excited to have you as our guest this morning. I also want to welcome everybody that's tuning in online. Church, can we give it up for everybody that's online right now? So glad to have you guys hanging out with us. So uh, last week we kicked off a series called Partners in the Gospel, and we're going through the book of Philippians. And uh, this is an incredible book. How many guys read it this past week? five people. Awesome. That's great. That's great. Listen, I want to encourage you guys to read it. It's only four chapters long, and literally you could read this book in about less than 15 minutes. Um, but man, it is an incredible book, and only and, and just because it's only four chapters long um, doesn't mean we're going to breeze through this series. There's so much that we're going to talk about uh, within these pages. As a matter of fact, we're, we're only going to cover two verses today. And so I got a lot to unpack, and so if you guys would, you can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Philippians uh, chapter uh, chapter 1, and uh, if you don't have your Bibles, that's cool. You can follow along on the uh, screens and, and the notes online, or the verses online. But like I said, we got two chapters, and we're going to jump right into it, and we're looking at verses 1, verses, verses one through 2, and it says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus... To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Two verses today. And essentially what we're going to look at is we're, we're going to look at three things, and it really is just the outline of what we're seeing in these two verses today. And we're going to look at the author, the recipient, and then we're also going to look, lastly, at the greeting. And there, again, I really believe that there's so much that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us through these two verses. And so as we look at this today, the very first thing we're going to look at is the author of this book. And actually, this is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. Last week, we have kind of looked at the background and how the church in Philippi began. And Paul was the one that actually started the church. In Acts chapter 16, he went and traveled just like he would. He, he went um, to different cities planting churches. He would go and make disciples, as Jesus said, making fully devoted followers of Jesus, right? And he would go and preach the gospel, make disciples, and whenever there was more than one disciple, a church was formed. And last week, what we saw in Acts chapter 16, for anyone that wasn't here, um, he went to Philippi, and, uh, and by the Holy Spirit's leading, because he was led by the Holy Spirit, the gospel spread through Europe and eventually made its made, made us way to the whole Western Hemisphere, which is the reason why we have the gospel here today. All because Paul was led by the Spirit. We learned about that last week. And what happens is that he stays there in Philippi for about three months. And three months, after three months, he goes and moves on to another city to go make disciples and plant churches. Side note, we want to be a church that makes disciples and plant churches. That's the kind of church we want to be. One that is boldly going into places where the gospel is maybe not proclaimed or maybe where there's not healthy churches existing. And we want to be able to go make disciples and plant churches. And that's exactly what Paul did. And so he goes three months later, he moves on to a really different tone to it. Some of the other letters that Paul maybe wrote were had to deal with like doctrinal issues or maybe there's problems in the church dealing with like, you know, hypocrisy and, you know, drama and division, all this stuff. But Philippians is really different. Like there's a different tone to this letter. As a matter of fact, like he, he really has this endear, endearment towards the Philippian church. Like he really just loves them so much so that he calls them his partners in the gospel. Because they had such a love for Paul and for the gospel and for the gospel being proclaimed that they literally were his partners. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why Paul writes his letter is because the Philippian church had actually sent him a gift to support him in his ministry through a man named Ep 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 Epaphroditus. Everybody say Epaphroditus. That's a, that's a tough one, all right? Let's try that one more time. Epaphroditus. All right, Epaphroditus. And so anyways, this man Epaphroditus, he comes, he brings Paul this gift, and he fell, he, he gets sick, and, and he has to go back to Philippi. And so Paul takes advantage of this and sends him back with this letter. 
Most likely, Timothy was the one that wrote out this letter, as we'll see here more in a minute about who Timothy was. But essentially, Paul writes this letter. He takes advantage of this to encourage the Philippian believers in their faith to really just show how much he loves them and, and to, uh, to really just speak to this idea that they're partners in the gospel with him. One of the themes in this book is the, the idea of joy. As a matter of fact, the word joy or rejoice and other variations are mentioned over 19 times in this little book in the Bible. And so there's so much that we can learn from it. So he says, Paul and Timothy. And Timothy, we find out, was somebody that joined Paul in Acts chapter 16. It says that he was a disciple of Jesus. And he grew up, his dad was not a believer. He was a Greek, uh, probably worshipped Greek gods. But his mom was a Jewish believer. And he ends up at a young age giving his life to the Lord. Paul says elsewhere that Timothy has this sincere faith for Christ. And so Paul loved, Je or Timothy loved Jesus. He was a disciple. He was all in for Jesus. And he was young. It says that in Acts chapter 16 that, that everyone spoke highly of Timothy. Like he was developing character. He was growing in his walk with God. And one of the things I love about Timothy is that, you know, just to hear those descriptions that he's someone who's a disciple of Christ, but he's also building character. And we know later on that he gets called into ministry, which is the reason why Paul calls him and asks Timothy to come and join him on this mission. And you know, the thing, one of the things when I was reading about this is that, that really just stood out to me is that there are so many people that maybe you feel a sense of calling in your life to go into ministry, which is an honorable call. It really is, man. There's, there's something special about being able to proclaim the gospel. But more often than, than not, there's a lot of people who go into ministry for the wrong reasons and are trying to just go ahead and become a pastor or become a leader somewhere. And here you find Timothy. It says that he was a disciple of Jesus. And he, was, he, he had a great reputation. You know, Timothy wasn't trying to jump ahead of God's timing in his life. He was focused on his walk with Jesus. He was focused on building character in his life. And then at the right time, man, Paul calls him to come and join him in ministry. And so Timothy ends up traveling with Paul, and he ends up becoming the writer, or he's a, he's a scribe for this letter. And, and it goes on to say, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ. Jesus. Servants of Christ Jesus. And I love this phrase right here. He says, servants of Christ Jesus. There's been other times that when you look at Paul's letters where he'll say something like apostle of Christ Jesus, or he'll say something, you know, uh, um, he'll refer to his calling in ministry. And, and, and essentially during those times, he, he's, he's talking about his title, his position of authority that God's given him to maybe deal with, with some uh, inner turmoil within some of the churches. And an apostle was a special calling, right? But in this passage of Scripture, Paul says this. He doesn't use his title. He doesn't flaunt it in their faces. He says, a servant of Christ Jesus. A servant of Christ Jesus. That word servant literally means, in the, in the Greek, it means it's this word doulos, and it means to be it's, it's essentially a slave. And during that time period in the Roman Gre Greco culture, right, we know that slavery was prominent, unfortunately. And literally, slaves back then had no rights. But Paul uses this term to describe his position and his calling that he is a slave, he is a servant of Christ Jesus. He's not throwing his title around. You know, beware of anyone that has to throw their titles around. We've seen a lot of abuse and scandals within churches nowadays, and so apostle so-and-so and prophet so-and-so and all this stuff. Now, And I'm not negating those gifts and callings, but there's something about this idea that I think in American Christianity, we have just completely missed the point of what being a disciple is. We are called to be servants of Christ Jesus, especially those of us who call ourselves pastors and shepherds and leaders within the church. And Paul says, we are servants of Christ Jesus. We are slaves of Christ, meaning this, that we have no rights. We belong to Jesus, and Jesus is a good, good, 
master and savior. He is a benevolent, good, gracious savior. And Paul says he's a servant of Christ Jesus. But you know what? This term isn't just for someone that's in ministry. This term is actually applicable to every single believer in Christ. It is something that we should strive for. Like we are saved by God's grace, but you know what? Learning to be a servant takes time. And this is something that Paul is constantly admonishing us. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, become a servant, right? He talks about this. And what's so interesting is that this word that Paul uses here in, in Philippians chapter 1, he also uses it in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to cover that in the, in the next couple of weeks uh, when we go through that passage of Scripture. But he actually says this. He says, he, he's talking to the Philippian church. He says, listen, you guys have the same attitude of Christ and become a servant just like Jesus did. I'm paraphrasing. But he uses that same word that Jesus was a servant. And Paul says that we should have that same attitude. And so for those of us who are followers of Jesus, the question then for us is, how good are we at being a servant? Do do others view us as servants of Christ? Because we are called to be servants. We're called to reflect Christ in our everyday life. For those of us who are married, we're called to serve each other. For those of us who are employers, we're called, to have, we're called to lead our company or our, our, our employees with a servant's heart, right? For those of us who are employees, we're called to serve the company that God has placed us in, right? We're called to work theirs unto the Lord. For, for those of us, you know, maybe you have neighbors, we're, we're called to serve our neighbors. If we come to church, we shouldn't look at church as something where we get to be served. We should look at it as a place where we can come to serve others. We are called to be servants of Christ Jesus. What do people say about you? Would people look at you, would people look at us as servants? Paul says we are servants of Christ Jesus. So the author is Paul here, and it goes on into who this letter is written to, the recipients of this letter. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. To all the saints in Christ Jesus. Everybody say saints. I love this term. This term saints literally means consecrated to God, holy, sacred, and pious. Consecrated to God. Now, I want you guys to think about something because this word has kind of been diminished over time. As a matter of fact, the Catholic Church has done an injustice by sainting certain Christians throughout history. How many of you guys have ever heard of like St. Augustine or St. Patrick or St. Peter, right? We've all heard those terms. And I think it started off as maybe something innocent and pure. It was like they wanted to honor certain Christians who maybe did a great work for God. But over time, what ended up happening is that whenever these, these certain individuals died, they, they sainted them, right, and venerated them. And it almost became, it became super unhealthy because they, it's like they worshiped them, right? And then it became political over time. And so it, it became this political thing to be sainted. And so this idea of becoming a saint in many of our mindsets really has been diminished. Like for some of us, we view Christianity, we we view certain Christians as more holier than us. Like we look at maybe some famous preacher like Billy Graham or or some other pastor or Mother Teresa and are like, oh man, they're saints, but man, I'm I'm not as holy as them. They have a special relationship, relationship with God. Some of us, you know, we we view ourselves as just simply sinners saved by grace. How many of you guys have ever used that term before? Right? But I want you to understand something. That term, sinner saved by grace, is not used in Scripture. The the reality of it is, is that we were sinners who are now saved by grace. And Paul uses this term, saint, he uses it all throughout his letters to describe believers. Like never does he ever use the word saint to describe any special Christian. As a matter of fact, the word saint is used over 67 times in the New Testament. And it's always to describe believers. Now I want you to think about that. 
you are a saint. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are holy, you are sacred, you are consecrated unto God. That is the most true thing about you. That doesn't mean you're perfect. As a matter of fact, Paul uses this word saint when he's writing to the Corinthian church, and man, they were jacked up. They were just like you, jacked up, mess up, right? And he calls them saints, he calls them holy, he calls them consecrated unto God, and, and, and really what he's describing is who they are in Christ. See, listen, when you look at Scripture, especially when you look at the New Testament, man, the word sinner is not used to describe those who are in Christ Jesus. Why don't you listen to me? That word sinner is used over 300 times in the Bible. There's about three times in the New Testament where it's kind of like it's, it, 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 the context is he's referring to unbelievers, but some people might mistake it as us as believers. But 67 times he calls us saints. And I want you to think about the implications of that. Like, think about, like, who the audience was that Paul was writing to. If you were here last week, you heard the backstory of the Philippian church. One of the individuals that gets saved was this, was this slave girl who was demonically possessed. And you want to talk about someone who was maybe, maybe struggling with shame and condemnation, who probably struggled with all sorts of things, like learning to grow in her walk with Christ. I guarantee you that she really struggled with things. And imagine her hearing this letter saying, you're a saint. You're holy. What that means for us, friends, is that our life, our past does not define our present if we are in Christ Jesus. Some of us are living the identity of shame. And I want you to understand that God says you are holy. You're sacred. You belong to me. You're a saint in Christ Jesus. There is no second-class Christianity for special people. And listen, what he says here, he says you're a saint in Christ. And this is the key word. You're a saint in Christ. That idea in Christ is used over 143 times in the New Testament. And it is such a powerful, powerful phrase. What it speaks to, it speaks to our position of who we are now in Christ Jesus. Once you understand that, it speaks to our position in Christ. That we are now saints in Christ. Our sainthood, us being holy, doesn't come from ourselves. That's the problem. Some of us have a hard time even right now going, oh, I'm no saint. Yeah, I believe in Jesus, but man, I really struggle with things. No, no, see, that's the problem because you're looking at yourself. What you need to understand and what Paul's trying to convey to all of us is that we are saints not in the, of ourselves, but we are saints in Christ. So here, here's what I want to do. And I actually, this, this illustration came to me this morning as I was getting ready. And, uh, but I was thinking about this, but just to, t to help us understand this. So there's only two types of people in the world, okay? You guys need to understand this. When you look at what God's word says, there's only two types of people. There are believers and there are unbelievers. There are saints, there are sinners. Anyone who is not a follower of Jesus, okay, listen, anyone who's not a follower of Jesus, you're, you're, an, un, you're an unbeliever. You're a sinner, right? You're separated from God. Everyone who is a follower of Jesus, you are a saint. You are in relationship with God. You're a believer in Jesus. You're a disciple, right? There's all these terms that we use. Paul says it like this. He says that you are either in Christ or in Adam. So check this out. All right? There's only two types of people. Believers, unbelievers, saints, sinners. In Christ or in Adam. What does this mean right here? In, in Adam. Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about that because Adam sinned, every single person that has ever been born, we were born into sin. We were born into Adam. You guys with me? We were born, that's why this is a problem with all of us. When we're born into this world, right? We struggle with sin. We love sin. We love doing things for, for our own selves, right? We don't want to follow God. We're, why? Our nature is dead. We are spiritually dead. Why? Because of sin. 
Okay, so I want you to understand that. So every single one of us was born into Adam. So me, myself, and I, guess what? I was born into Adam, okay? This is me, right? Before Jesus, this is me. Look at that mean mug on that face, right? I was not happy, okay? This is me being born into Adam, right? In Adam, guess what? We are guilty of sin. We are dead in sin. We are slaves to sin. We, we have no freedom, right? This is why being good enough won't get us into heaven. Why? Because we're born spiritually dead. We're in Adam. Our location is spiritually dead. There's nothing we can do to get God, but check this out. When we get saved, when we give our lives to Jesus, guess what happens? We become born again. And now... Our location changes spiritually. So now, guess what? We're, we're in Christ, right? We're in Christ Jesus, okay? And so listen, this is our position. And so Paul says, in Christ, guess what? You're a saint. You're holy. You're blameless. You're righteous. You're pure. You're separated. You're consec consecrated unto God. You are free from sin. You're dead to sin. You're alive. You're seated with Christ. There's so many things we can say about this, friends, but I want you to understand something. See, the enemy doesn't want us to know this. He wants us to think that we still go back into Adam. And so when we say, man, I'm just a sinner saved by God's grace, guess what? If you believe that, well, guess what's going to happen? You're, you're going to live what you believe, right? And this is a problem with some of us. Man, we, we make these confessions about who we are and the things we struggle with. And, and, and don't mishear me. I'm not saying if you're in Christ Jesus that you're not going to sin. No, we, we, we do sin. We're not perfect. But our position doesn't change. We're in Christ Jesus. And this is such good news. Saints are... Are, are people who sin sometimes, right? But we don't, but the, but the most truest thing about it is that we don't love our sin. There's something, our nature has changed, right? And so Paul, this is the reason why Paul is always reminding believers about who they are. Even before he deals with their behavioral issues. Because the problem is, is that many of us haven't had our minds renewed by God's word. And so we think that we're sinners and we think that we're still in sin. We think that sin has, uh, it, that we're still enslaved to sin when scripture says you're dead to sin. And so if we believe that about ourselves, we're going to continue to walk in it. Paul says, no, you're saint. You're free. Why? So therefore, when we get God's word into us and we start believing who we are and whose we are, then we can start walking in freedom and become who God has called us to be. Are you guys following me? We are saints in Christ Jesus. And so for anyone, some of you guys have been hounded by shame and condemnation and you're struggling with sin issues. You're struggling with behavioral issues. And you know what the problem is? It's not that you're in sin. It's not that you're dead in, in sin if you're a follower of Jesus. The problem is, is that you don't know who you are. It's an identity issue. And this is why Paul says you are saints in Christ Jesus. This is your location. This is your position. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Listen, their physical location is in Philippi. Your physical location might be in Conyers, might be in Covington, but your spiritual location is in Christ Jesus. So the recipients of this letter are the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Including the overseers and deacons. Who are these? These are leaders. These are local leaders that God has established in the church. And this is really important for us to understand this. God has always established uh, leadership within his kingdom. And these are leadership positions that are positions of servanthood. Not to lord it over people. And so we see two positions here. There's, there's one called overseers, right? And the word overseer, it, it can be translated in many different ways. It could be elders. It could be pastors or shepherds or, or, um, um, uh, or even bishop, right? That's where that word comes from. And what we see in, in these um, local churches in the New Testament is that there's a plurality. There's several elders that are helping to lead the church of God. And that role has high qualifications. 
It's not something to be taken lightly. It's not. There's a calling to it. There's character qualifications. Scripture says that anyone that wants to be an overseer, they desire a noble task, but realize there's a stricter judgment for those of us who are in leadership. It's not something to be taken lightly. But you see that healthy churches have a plurality of elders within a local church. Matter of fact, even here at our local church here, I'm not just a one-man show. There's five of us as elders, and together we serve and lead this church as God has called us to. And it's healthy. And there's qualifications that, that, are, that, are, uh, that are required for us. There's accountability. And we see this other word, deacon, that's used here. And, and, and it literally means a waiter or one who serves. And essentially the way deacons came about, and this is actually the first time this word is used in the, in the common uh, New, New Testament, like the, the actual word deacon in this context and it, and it means someone who serves, essentially. And it comes from Acts chapter 6, where essentially there was uh, the, the early church, they were serving the widows, and they were distributing, uh, distributing funds and, and, and just trying to help widows out. And what took place is that the apostles, some of the leaders of the church, man, they were getting bogged down between preaching and teaching and praying and trying to witness and getting thrown in jail and then trying to keep up with all the administrative duties that were required of them. And so... They said, hey, we don't have time to wait on tables. We don't have time because we're, we're so called up with what God's called us to do. So that's where that word comes from, to wait on tables. And so it says that the, the very next verse says that they chose seven men to wait on tables. And that's where the idea of a deacon comes from. And so essentially it is a servant leadership position also within the local church. Why am I saying this? Because as partners in the gospel, we need to understand that to be a healthy church, everyone has a role to play. Some people are called to serve in positions of leadership. Some people are called to serve in other areas. But every single one of us has a role to play. Paul goes on to say, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. And listen to this. He says, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the greeting. And all of, all of Paul's letters are structured this way because this is how they would write letters back then. They would always start with the author and who they're writing to and then the greeting, right? And, and Paul makes this statement. I don't want you guys to miss this. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Grace to you. In Greek times, the way Greeks would write letters to one another, they, they would always say that phrase, grace to you, right? And Paul uses this word, it's the word charis, and it means, it literally means unmerited favor from God. Unmerited favor from God. Meaning that when you became a believer in Christ Jesus, you didn't earn it. It was complete free of charge, completely free of charge, like God's grace was given to you. But you know what? Grace doesn't just stop at salvation, and this is what, why Paul always uses this terminology in his letters. He, he's always starting his letters with this idea because he's trying to say, hey, you, you didn't just like get saved by grace. You are in a state of grace. Grace is to you. Why? Because you are in Christ. But Paul takes this statement a little bit further. He doesn't just say grace to you. He also says in peace. And this wasn't used in Greek times. This was something that was added in by Paul. Paul being Jewish, whenever Jews would, meet, would uh, greet one another, they would say this word shalom. And so Paul most likely had this idea in mind because he uses the same phrase in the Greek, which means completeness and wholeness. And so Paul's saying, grace to you and peace, wholeness unto you. And friends, this is such good news for us. Because this is a constant state that we as believers, we're in. God's grace is upon us. God's peace goes before us. We've been saved by God's grace and now we have peace with God. That's so powerful. 
Some of you have struggled this week and God is saying grace to you. Some of you have battled all sorts of things this past week with your family. Maybe just mental attacks and you feel just chaos in your life right now. The scripture is reminding us that we have peace that surpasses all understanding. It's peace that brings wholeness. It's a peace that relinquishes fear and anxiety. It's a peace that we have constant access to. Grace to you and peace. And it's not something that we can just conjure up. It comes from who? It comes from God our Father. God our Father. Sometimes I think, especially like in the Bible Belt, we take that for granted, that God is our Father. Like we do, we take that so for granted. But you need to understand, like these, the, the recipients of this letter back then, to hear that God is a Father was just mind-blowing. Many of them, you know, worship pagan gods, and they're pagan false gods, and I'm saying lower G gods, these idols. Man, they were vindictive. They were lustful. They were vengeful. They were full of wrath. There was no mercy. And nowhere in the ancient world, scholars say that, that there was this idea that God was this loving father. Then to the Jews, right, they, they knew God. They saw glimpses of God as a father, but then Jesus really introduces the idea that God is our father by calling him Abba, which means daddy. And Paul reiterates this all throughout his letters that we have been adopted that we have a father in heaven that greatly loves us some of us man we didn't have a good father or we didn't know our father or we were hurt by our father maybe we, you know you had a good dad but he was imperfect like any dad is and our father in heaven is not the same as our earthly father he's a father who loved us and chose us in Christ who gave us grace who offered us peace through Christ and scripture tells us that we have been adopted in Christ Jesus you're adopted you have a loving father in heaven who looks at you through the lens of being in Christ being righteous holy and blameless being his you belong to your father and the idea of adoption is so powerful. And I, I love this idea, this phrase from, um, from J.I. Packer. He says this, speaking about our adoption. He says here that adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers. Listen to this. Don't miss this. Adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers higher even than justification or being made right with God, like being declared righteous. That's what that word means. He says, to be right with God the judge is a great thing. It is a great thing. We know that God is holy, he's sovereign, he will judge sin, but he's also gracious and merciful, and for anyone that comes to him, he adopts them into his family, right? And so that's what, that's what J.L. Packer is saying here. He says, to be right with God, the judge, is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by the Father is even greater. It's even greater. Friends, do you believe that today? Like, what do you believe about God? Like, what lies has the enemy told you as a believer? That God hates you? that God is going to condemn you. See, what we believe about God, as one person said, is, most, is the most important thing about us. See, if you view God as vindictive and angry at you, man, you are missing out on the grace and peace that comes from him. And today, the most true thing about you, friends, is that you, if you're a a man in here, you are a son of God. If you are a female in here, you are a daughter of God, and you are greatly loved. He says, grace to you and peace from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this is possible because of Jesus, right? All of this. 
We could be servants of Christ because God saved us by his grace through Jesus. We, can, we are saints in Christ because God saved us by his grace. We are now in Christ. We, we have access to grace and peace constantly. Why? Because ultimately what Jesus accomplished on the cross was everything. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. All this possible because of what Christ has done. He says, he uses this phrase here, Lord Jesus Christ. And what's so interesting about that term Lord is that like to say that back then literally meant martyrdom. You could be thrown in jail because during that time period, if you said anyone was Lord besides Caesar, it was a death sentence. See, the Christian's who saw Jesus rise from the dead, they began to declare him as Lord of all. They were willing to risk their lives to the very end. Paul ends up getting beheaded by Nero. And he says, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's who we serve today, his grace. But there's some of us today, man, maybe we don't know Jesus as Lord. The scripture is so clear that one day every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And today for anyone, maybe you're not a believer. I've talked a lot to believers today. But maybe you're here today, you're watching online, you're not a believer. I want you to understand that all of us were born into sin. We were We all stand guilty before God, but God, who is rich in love, offers you grace, forgiveness, unmerited favor, and he offers you peace with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's just a matter of you simply receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord. That's it. That's it. As we're getting ready to close today, I want us to in just a couple minutes, we're going to have a time of response. For those of us who are believers, I want us to think about these ideas about being a servant. What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you about? This idea of identity. Maybe you needed to be reminded of that today, that you are a saint, that you're adopted, that you're loved by God. Maybe you've been struggling with fear and anxiety and worry and you feel like your whole world is being blown to pieces, but God is saying, your Father in heaven is saying, hey, I've come to give you peace today.